Welcome to Wellsprings Community Church. Shall we pray together? Let's pray. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we ask that you would incline our hearts to your word. We ask that you would open our eyes, that we would see wonderful things in it. That you would give us whole hearts that seek Christ alone. And we ask that you would come and satisfy our hearts this morning. So please speak to us in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Hashtag blessed. I don't know if you remember, but that, that became a bit of a social media cliche. Hashtag blessed. So you would find pictures of a, a sweet family. Hashtag blessed. Or a picture of Lionel Messi, he's definitely hashtag blessed. Or maybe a cute baby, not all babies are cute, so you find a cute one and it's hashtag blessed. Or a beautiful person, hashtag blessed. And you find all those, you can find millions of pictures online, hashtag blessed. And you may may have posted one yourself, I'm not getting at you, but you may have used it, hashtag blessed. A picture of yourself, I'm a blessed one. But you never find when you look through all those pictures of of people having a bad hair day and they say hashtag blessed or massive spot on my face hashtag blessed or somebody being shouted at blessed or somebody posting a picture of the Premier League table and it's Sheffield United hashtag blessed. You don't find that. You don't find a grieving person hashtag blessed. And yet Jesus here On this passage that's come to known as the the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the weak. In verse 11, blessed are you when people insult you. What's Jesus saying? And in Matthew 5 to 7, known as the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus here is talking about discipleship. And I think one of the things that encourages me about Jesus is that he's so open with us. He's so honest with us. He's upfront with us about our fears as Christian disciples. He understands us. He gets our concerns. Because we do think, is the best life the blessed life? Is it the best, the most blessed to follow him? The poor in spirit, those who mourn, the meek, those who are insulted. And up up to this point in Matthew's gospel, following Jesus means repentance. In other words, being honest about ourselves and our own failures. And following Jesus means dropping everything and actually following him. By the end of, of, of our reading, following Jesus means being verbally abused on the account of Christ. And Jesus says throughout the Sermon on the Mount, five to seven, chapters five to seven, following Jesus actually means do not be like them, the Gentiles, the world, those who aren't Christians. But if I'm honest, the voices in my head say to me, do be like them. Give yourself a break. Fit in. Blend in. Are we mad to put up with any awkwardness on account of Jesus? Today, Jesus from Matthew 5 wants to persuade us that we're not crazy to throw our lot in with him. His disciples are the truly blessed ones. And we'll see here that Jesus has a colossal vision not just of our future when we'll see God, but he has big ambitions for our life now. We're going to see that we're going to be global influencers. We, we saw a bit of that from Oxford Brooks. I don't know what you're doing with wine, cheese, and, and jazz. University has changed in my day. I was sort of off to the pub, bring your non-Christian mate and try to tell him something. Or you saw it in Ukraine. We're global influencers. Influence in the world for Jesus. And that's what Jesus wants to persuade us of this morning. 
And the story so far in Matthew's gospel is heaven has invaded earth. The light has dawned. If you look in your Bibles at chapter 4, you have a little picture of heaven. Evil, illness, and affliction are blown away by the special one. And when you reach Matthew 5, 1, Jesus has gone viral. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came to him. And it's a bit of a surprise that that he he sort of steps away from the crowds. You see that so often in the Gospels. Because he's not after the crowds for, for crowd's sake, for popularity's sake. He's in it to make all in disciples. People who follow him. The crowds are listening. And when you, when you get to the end of chapter 7, they're amazed at all that Jesus has said. They are listening. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, it's brilliant you're here. But I hope as you hear the words of the great teacher... You will be amazed by what he says. But he's speaking here to his disciples. And he's telling them. He's offering them reassurance. That you're not pathetic. If you follow me. You're actually one of the blessed ones. You're blessed. I want to just begin in verse 2. By looking at the word blessed. In verse 2 it says, and he began to teach them, he said, blessed. And we need to, we need to sort of understand what that word means. It does sound like a, a church word. I don't know if you use it. Maybe if somebody sneezes, you say, you say bless you. I don't know if we still do that today. But it sounds like a religious word, blessed. And if you say bless it, it makes you sound even more religious. Some translations call it happy. I think happy is a result of being blessed. I'm not sure if happy is the best word. Some people say it means lucky, but we we can't say that in church because we don't believe in luck. Some people say fortunate, but that's just the posh way. Oxford Brooks might say fortunate. That's the way they say lucky. I don't know. I'm sorry. Some people say flourishing is good, but I think that's a bit too high church for me. So blessed basically means you're in a good place. You're favored. You're in a good place. And look at the ones who are in the good place. The poor in spirit. Those who mourn. The meek. The low down ones. People in a good place are the ones who have come to Jesus and admitted that naturally they're not in a good place. That's who's in a good place. And look at it, blessed are the poor in spirit. Not necessarily the, the, the sort of economically poor, but it's the spiritually bankrupt. It's those who realize they've, they've nothing to offer Jesus. Blessed are those who mourn. It's the ones who regret my life of failure. Verse 5, blessed are the meek. It's the ones who admit that they're, they're lowly. Rather than than talking myself up to God, they realize, you know, I'm really not all that. And it's all very counterculture, isn't it? We're so used to pushing ourselves to the front. We're so used to talking ourselves up. That's even what most religions do. It's certainly what the Pharisees did. They would go around saying, look at me, look at hear what I say. I'm a decent person. And Jesus says, no, no. The kingdom of heaven is for those who get that they're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. And the discipleship that Jesus is looking for here never moves on from the the fact that we're humble. And we need a humble sense of our own unworthiness, that we are lowly. That we've nothing off to offer God. But actually we need to throw ourselves on Jesus again and again. On his grace and on his mercy. And just something that we need to know before we move further. That the Sermon on the Mount, it's not a checklist for entry into the kingdom. Jesus isn't saying, if you clean up your act... 
If you be more like this, then you can come to God. That's not what the Sermon on the Mount is. This is people who are already disciples. And in the first few verses have already worked out that they've taken their mask off. That they've stopped trying to self-justify. And that the future belongs to those who have repented. Who have turned from themselves and turned to Christ because they so desperately need Christ. And I hope this morning you find that a liberating place to start. Because it says this morning that you don't have to pretend with God. We are blessed based on nothing of ourselves. You remember the hymn, nothing in my hand I bring. We are blessed because we have nothing to offer except words like sorry, help me, give me grace, show me mercy. And that's why this is such good news because that's what we need and it's free. And the place where Jesus meets us is chapter 5, verse 3. It's that place of repentance. Because it's the place of our admission of our need. Jesus can't help people if they don't think they need him. And that's where we meet him, at the place of repentance. It's a good place. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. And as the blesseds go on, if you look at the list, we move on from repentance to bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, to steal John the Baptist's phrase. Verse 6 is, is not just confessing our unrighteousness, but it's being hungry and thirsty and loving righteousness. Verse seven, if you've been shown mercy, you'll, you'll be merciful. Verse eight, if you get the uncleanness of your heart as the problem, you'll want to God to change it from within. Verse nine, a peacemaker, because God has made peace with you. And you'll start to show these fruits in keeping with a a new life. And verse 11 feels very strange if Jesus is trying to encourage discipleship. Notice the shift from the third to the second person. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Not a threat to my life described here. But it's definitely a threat to my easy life, to my comfortable life. And yet Jesus says, you're the blessed ones. Have you ever been misunderstood on account of Jesus? Ever been wrongly accused? Do you know what they say behind your back? It's persecution for righteousness sake on account of Jesus. And on the Sermon of the Mount, it's a, it is a beautiful picture of Jesus. He is the hero of the Sermon on the Mount. He is describing himself in many ways. And as beautiful as he is, it does bring us into conflict when we try to be like him and not like them. So is it worth it? Is being different worth it? And Jesus says, yes, it is. You're blessed. You're in a good place. And what I love here is at the end of each sentence, you, 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 get, a, you get a snippet of what the kingdom of heaven is like. So in verse four, it's the place of comfort. If, if you're a blessed one, if you're one of Jesus' disciples, you inherit the earth. You're filled You're satisfied. You receive mercy. Did you notice verse 8? You will actually see God. You will see God. Think of it. Verse 9, you'll be children of God. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So it's not hashtag poor me, 
the Christian life. It's hashtag blessed me. We are blessed. And verse 12, rejoice and be glad. And I'm not saying being insulted for, for Christ is a joyful thing. It's difficult. I don't know if you're the only Christian in your, your family. It's really difficult. You're only Christian in, in, in your class. It's difficult. But look what Jesus says. You're in good company. It's always been that way. You're, you're with God's prophets. Moses, Elijah, blessed company to be in. Rejoice because the future is yours if you've sided with Jesus despite the cost. And before we get to the end of the talk, I, I want to say one more thing as we finish. Because Jesus, Jesus makes it clear that we have this great hope, we will see God, we will inherit the earth. And he's not just telling us, you know, grit your teeth and hold on to the end. You will get there, just bear through. But he shows us here that we have a great purpose today. A great purpose in the world. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. When I, when I was reading that, some, 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 some things strike me and some things don't. And sometimes I just read the Bible as if I've read this before and, you know, I know this. And, right, let's get to the praying. Let's, I, need, I need to do some work or something. But did you notice you are the light of the world? I thought Jesus was the light of the world. And he is. But the Sermon on the Mount is a portrait of what it's like to be like him. And as we repent, and as we ask for his mercy and his grace, we will shine. We will be the light in the world. And you'll be salty as well. My only experience of salty is that it's the steam engine, isn't it? And Thomas the Tank Engine. I don't know why I'm looking at you, Simon. Seen Thomas the Tank Engine lately? Yes. Salty is the one that works around the harbour. Salty. We'll be salty, but not like him. We'll be light, we'll be salt, we'll be a city. I think the message is we'll all stand out. We'll be unmistakably different from what's around us. Think of the light. It's the dominant picture here. Remember, remember light has dawned in Matthew's gospel at the coming of Jesus. This is a, a, a world we live in and it's dark. And you Christians, you're the light in the darkness. Picture the city on a hill. I don't know if it's a, it's a picture, you know, Stirling Castle in Scotland or Edinburgh Castle or Northern Ireland doesn't have any great castles. Carrick Fergus Castle, but it's not on a hill. But think of, the, think of the castle on the hill and you're driving up to it or you're walking up to Edinburgh Castle. It's impressive, isn't it? The lights are on. as a place of, of awe. It's dramatic. And back in Jesus' day, the, to see the city on the hill was to see hope, was to see safety, was to see security, was to see rest, was to see salvation. And that's what the people are meant to see when they look at us. We're the city on the hill. And you can't hide. Verse 15, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. You know, you go down to Ikea outside Exeter and, and you go and you think, right, I'll buy a new lamp. And we did that. We, we bought a new lamp in Ikea. Where is it? Well, you know, I've switched it on and everything, but where have you put it? I can't see it. Well, it's actually upstairs in a cupboard, but it looks really well in the cupboard. It lights it up splendidly. And sometimes I think we do that. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Hiding the light. I think it's understandable sometimes why we hide when you look at the previous verses. Or we hide our righteousness by being like people. But that's not God's big plan. That's not his purpose. Look at it. 
In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good work deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Do you see God's big purpose? Yes, we've got a great hope inheriting the earth, seeing God. But we don't have to grit our teeth. This is our purpose. And it's an awesome vision of the church. An awesome vision of the church family. The city on the hill. And Jesus this morning is saying to you, be to the people of Taunton, of Wellsprings, be the city on a hill. I think that's why we try to invite our friends to church. That's why we want people to come to, to the CU. That's why we want to get 100 people to the CU to hear about Jesus. And we want more people to come in here. And it's not just come and hear about Jesus. Though that's key, but it's come and see. Come and see what Jesus is doing amongst us. Come and experience Jesus in our fellowship. Something different's going on. I don't know if you're visiting here this morning. If you are, you're very welcome. I don't know if you're on the fringe of this church. You've probably worked out if you're visiting or if you're on the fringe, you've worked out that this church isn't perfect. I can say that because, you know, nobody knows me. It's like, it's like Exmouth Chapel. Exmouth Chapel is nowhere near perfect. But we can be thankful, can't we? Because we're a city on a hill. Because Jesus is at work amongst us, changing us. We are showing him off, aren't we? And then as you disperse into the week ahead, your lamp's in the dark place, shining. And Jesus says, shine before others, shine among them. And that can be awkward at times. It can be awkward in your own family. It can be awkward with your friends or when you go out with them. But Jesus is saying, do that, be different, shine before them. Maybe you're in a community group. Maybe you're in a sports group. As you go to work, shine. They might be able to avoid coming to church, but they can't avoid your life shining beside them, hour by hour, and as you go through crisis by crisis. And if all this starts to make you guilty and feel guilty, can I say to you, go back to verse 3. Can I say... Go back and repent and confess and admit that we're terrible at this and we're weak at this and that we need Jesus all the time. And you know, as you repent and as you confess, I'm hopeless at this. And as you repent and confess, I don't want to be different because I don't want to be awkward with my friends. And as you do that, you're actually shining. Because repentance means that we're saying sorry, that we're crying out for help, that we're, that we're not self-justifying. And all of that shines very brightly in a proud, self-justifying world. And I think as you, as you read through, you can have this as, as homework, read through Matthew 5 to 7, look through it. And I think as you look through it, You'll need to come, keep coming back to Matthew 5, 3 because we need Jesus to live out Matthew 5 to 7. And it's interesting in these early verses, most of this is descriptive. Jesus is saying, this is who you are. You are different, so be different. And as you do that, it will make a difference. It will make a difference. Some will, will see Christ in you and they'll revile you. And they will give you a hard time. Others will see your good deeds and they'll become a God glorifier. I hope we realize the impact Jesus has designed our lives to have 
in this world. And I'm honest, I don't want to be awkward. I want to be liked. I feel that. But I have to remind myself, we live in a dark world. And in that darkness, Jesus has designed it that we're to be the light. Little old me and little old you, we are the beacon of hope. We are the light of the world. Let's pray. Father, we do confess and we do acknowledge that we struggle so so badly with this. Lord, even the picture that it paints of people who are poor in spirit, who are who mourn, who are meek. Lord, we struggle with that. So help us to hear Christ's words to us that they are the blessed ones. They are the favored ones. They are the ones who will inherit, who will see God, those who come and and own up to all our failures and, and turn to Christ for his mercy and grace. And Father, help us as a church, whether it's here, whether it's in Exmouth, help us, Lord, to, to realize that we are the light, the light of the world, that we're the salt, that we're the city on the hill. And we do pray that people would see us as a fellowship and be drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that they would come and they would hear about him. And Lord, we pray again for what we've prayed for earlier. We, it's amazing in a CU that numbers are doubling and people are coming. And Lord, we do pray that that CU would be a city on the hill. And we pray in the Ukraine for churches being planted and churches being planted and the church plants planting more churches and Lord in the darkness of that place and in the sadness and the hurt thank you that they see light and help us to take the responsibility that we are light forgive us when we want to fit in forgive us when we don't want to be awkward but help us Lord to to be the beacon of hope in a dark world. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.